A very small cause, which escapes our notice, determines a considerable effect that we cannot fail to see, and then we say the effect is due to chance. If we knew exactly the laws of nature and the situation of the universe at the initial moment, we could predict exactly the situation of that same universe at a succeeding moment. But even if it were the case that the natural laws had no longer any secret for us, we could still only know the initial situation. If that enables us to predict the succeeding situation with the same approximation, that is all we require, and we shall say that the phenomenon has been predicted, that it is governed by laws. But it is not always so. It may happen that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomena. A small error in the former will produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction becomes impossible, and we have the fortuitous phenomenon. These five butterfly effect examples will make you question everything. A civil war stabbing resulted in the invention of Coke. There are few more recognizable names than Coca-Cola, but few realize its invention came from a man being stabbed in the chest during the American Civil War that followed a chain of extraordinary events that saw the birth of the popular drink we know today. The tale of Coca-Cola's creation is perhaps one of the most chaotic, surprising, and shocking of any major brand still in business today. The story begins during the American Civil War, one of the bloodiest domestic conflicts in history that left a huge number of casualties on both sides. The use of morphine to ease their pain resulted in around 400,000 ex-troops becoming addicted to the drug, and the effects of the addiction became known as soldier's sickness. One of those affected was Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John Pemberton, who was stabbed in the chest at the Battle of Columbus. He began self-medicating with morphine to ease his pain and quickly became addicted. John was by trade a brilliant pharmaceutical chemist, and after the war, he turned his attention to finding a cure for the debilitating sickness afflicting soldiers throughout the United States. After experimenting with a variety of different chemical compositions, Pemberton stumbled across what he believed to be a cure. Using extract from cocoa leaves and the cola nut mixed with alcohol, he concocted a tonic he called Pemberton's French Coca Wine. As the name suggests, the key ingredient was cocaine. This was not unusual during the late 19th century, as cocaine was a popular additive in many drinks, even those marketed for children. Claims about the tonic's medical properties were hugely exaggerated, and cola wine was advertised as being an effective treatment for both morphine addiction, depression, alcoholism, and impotence. In 1886, Pemberton replaced the alcohol with sugar syrup and renamed the drink as Coca-Cola. But unfortunately for Pemberton, and for many thousands across America, cocaine was not an effective remedy for morphine addiction, and those who were already suffering from morphine addiction then became addicted to cocaine as well. Ironically, Pemberton himself became addicted, and his adult brain limited Coca-Cola's early growth. At one point, there were three companies using the name Coca-Cola, although Pemberton always retained the original formula. In 1888, John Pemberton was dead, and sole control was handed to his equally addicted son, Charlie. This is when businessman Asa Candler bought out the business and it was his aggressive marketing tactics that led to Coca-Cola's world dominance of the soft drinks market. Up until 1909, the drink still contained cocaine, but this was reduced when fresh coca leaves were replaced with spent leaves, meaning only trace levels of cocaine remained. Nowadays, Coca-Cola uses a cocaine-free coca leaf extract. If it hadn't been for a single stab wound to one man, followed by an extraordinary series of events, the name Coca-Cola would probably never exist. Sir Alexander Fleming and the invention of antibiotics. The discovery of penicillin revolutionized the world of medicine and the treatment of infections that were previously fatal could be cured with a simple course of antibiotics. But the way it was discovered was extraordinary, bordering on the unbelievable. And who would think that an untidy lab and a holiday was all it took? In 1928, Alexander Fleming, a professor of bacteriology at St. Mary's Hospital in London, was looking forward to a well-earned holiday, and in the rush to clock off, he left his lab in a mess, leaving Petri dishes strewn around. When Fleming returned to his lab a few weeks later, he began cleaning out the Petri dishes, 
he had been using to experiment with bacteria before his holiday. On one of the dishes, he noticed a mold growth on one of the cultures, and that the colonies of Staphylococcus bacteria that had immediately surrounded it had been destroyed, whereas other colonies further away were normal. He had, by complete accident, discovered the first naturally occurring antibiotic drug that would become known as penicillin. However, although Fleming knew the potential of what he had discovered, it was too difficult to purify and produce on a large enough scale, so he abandoned the project, and it wasn't until the 1930s that a team at Oxford, led by Howard Florey, picked up on the research and realised its enormous value to the world of medicine. If Fleming had not left his lab in a mess and gone on holiday, and penicillin hadn't been invented, it's estimated that 75% of the population might not be here today, as they would have either died from a bacteria infection or not been born at all as the result of their ancestors dying prematurely. Prior to its discovery, the most minor of injuries could prove fatal. It's also worth remembering that another event in history, namely the Second World War, made Florey and his team realise how useful penicillin could be to Britain's war efforts. And with the help of the UK and US governments, research and development went into overdrive. By D-Day, enough penicillin had been produced to use on 40,000 soldiers. It's thought that if the Allies had not invented and mass-produced penicillin by D-Day, they may not have won the war, as the Germans used predominantly sulfonamides or iodine to cure their diseases and infections. But this was an inferior product compared to penicillin, and they were not able to patch up their soldiers and send them back out fighting anywhere near as quickly as the Allies. Today, it's hard to imagine a world without antibiotics. Its discovery has spawned over a hundred different antibiotics that can treat even the most serious diseases and infections. However, all good things come to an end, and today, antibiotics are becoming less effective as superbugs are becoming more widespread. The overuse and misuse of antibiotics in agriculture have all contributed significantly to the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And at the moment, we are sitting on the brink of disaster with the possibility that the world could slip back into a time where people could die from an everyday infection. But we'll save that for another discussion. 9-11 may not have happened if Queen Victoria hadn't been born with a random genetic mutation. Queen Victoria was born in 1819 with a rare genetic mutation of one of her X chromosomes, meaning she was a carrier of the blood disorder, haemophilia, in females, this will not present any symptoms, they are just carriers. But for males, the condition can be potentially life-threatening, as just a small cut or graze can bleed profusely, as the condition means blood doesn't clot. So for Queen Victoria, it was not a problem. But when she had children, it was likely she would pass the condition onto them. In fact, she passed it onto three of her nine offspring. One of those children was her second daughter, Alice, who went on to pass the condition onto three of her own children, including her youngest daughter, Alexandra. Alexandra went on to marry Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and together they had four daughters and a son, Alexei, who she passed the faulty gene to. As a result of this, two things happened. Firstly, the family became almost reclusive in their effort to protect their son, Alexei. And secondly, in desperation, the family became dependent on the services of the mad monk Rasputin, who seemed to be the only person who was capable of managing Alexei's excessive bleeding. Tsar Nicholas II was not a popular ruler among the Russian people, due to his reliance on some unreliable advisors, and the common people became deeply suspicious of the family's relationship with Rasputin. This influenced what happened in late 1916, when Rasputin was murdered by minor members of the Russian nobility, and revolution broke out in Russia. This prompted Nicholas II to abdicate in 1917, and the whole family were taken prisoner by the Bolsheviks. The following year, Nicholas, Alexandra, and all five of their children were executed. This marked the end of the Russian Empire, and it was replaced by the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, with their communist ideology that spread it to boarding countries, creating the USSR. Over the next few decades, the USSR became a world powerhouse and played an important role in the Allied victories of World War II, and as a result of technological developments from that war, entered the Cold War with the United States. In 1979, they set their sights on conquering Afghanistan, 
and in December they invaded. The Afghan people fought back, and who provided them with weapons and training? The United States. One of the fighters who received instruction from the US was Osama bin Laden, who went on to form Al-Qaeda to fight against the Russians. In 1989, the USSR withdrew from Afghanistan, leaving the country in the chaos that led to civil war. Al-Qaeda chose to support and fight for the Taliban, who eventually won and became the political leaders of Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda planned several terrorist attacks, their first being against the World Trade Center in 1993, when they detonated a bomb in the basement of World Trade Center 1. Although Bin Laden was not the mastermind behind the World Trade Center 1 attacks, by the mid-90s, he had developed a hatred for the US due to their presence in the Middle East. And in 1998, he declared an official jihad against the US and began planning a bigger attack. If the story is to be believed, we all know what terrible event happened next. So if Queen Victoria had not been a carrier of haemophilia, would the chain of events that followed that led to the invasion of Afghanistan by the USSR never have happened? And everything in the world would have planned out differently. Just one small random thing can change everything else in its path. Suffragette was a mistake. Emily Davison was a suffragette who threw herself in front of the King's horse at the Epsom Derby on the 4th of June, 1913. Her actions highlighted the plight of women to get the vote and is a pinnacle moment in history that eventually changed the rights of women forever. At the time, Emily was hailed as a martyr who took her life so that the place of women could be changed forever. But it seems the whole thing may have been a tragic mistake and that Emily never intended to kill herself for that cause at all, meaning that had fate not intervened, the course of history and the rights of women may have panned out in a different way, and the lives of not one, but two people would have been saved. New evidence has emerged to suggest that Emily travelled from her home in London on a return ticket. Why did she do that if she intended on taking her life? Also, she had made holiday plans with her sister in the near future, suggesting she had no intention of killing herself. On that fateful day, despite film technology being in its early days, the race was captured on three newsreel cameras, and new technology has revealed that when Emily stepped out onto the track, she had a clear view of the King's horse, Amna, and she did not, as has always been perceived, recklessly charge out in front of the galloping horse, intent on throwing herself under its hooves. Instead, it's claimed she only meant to reach out and attach a flag to the horse's bridle. This theory is backed up by the fact the police found a flag on the floor after Emily was hit. In addition to this, it is claimed that Emily and other suffragettes were seen practicing at grabbing horses in the park near her mother's house, and they later drew lots to determine who would go to the derby. After colliding with Amna, Emily collapsed unconscious on the track and died of her injuries four days later in Epsom Cottage Hospital, and she was hailed as a martyr for the cause. However, despite using her name proved beneficial in equality between men and women, had she simply attached a flag to the horse, as research suggests was intended, her name may never be known. Amna's jockey that day was Herbert Jones, and after his horse hit Emily, he was thrown to the ground and suffered a mild concussion but the psychological damage was much more severe, and he was haunted by the face of Emily for the rest of his life. In 1951, his son found him dead in a gas-filled kitchen. Wolf Reintroduction Changes Ecosystem In 1914, in an effort to protect the deer population on public lands in the US, Congress released funds for the sole purpose of destroying deer predators, mainly wolves and prairie dogs and by 1926, they had virtually eliminated wolves from Yellowstone National Park in the US. However, no one could have foreseen that this one premeditated act of removing a species would have such an effect on the whole ecosystem of the park, and how the domino effect of killing off the wolves nearly brought it to its knees. Initially as predicted, the deer population thrived and built up to unmanageable levels, and the lack of predators meant they didn't move around as much, especially in winter, and gorged on young willow, aspen, and cottonwood plants, reducing some areas to nothing. This was tough for the beaver colonies, who needed willows to survive the winter, so their numbers started to dwindle. Things got so bad that by 1995, there was only one beaver colony in the park. 
This is when it was decided to reintroduce the Grey Wolf back into Yellowstone, and the direct and indirect consequences of this one decision were astonishing. The predatory presence of the wolves meant the deer no longer stayed in one place for long, and so did not intensely graze the vegetation, meaning it had time to recover. This benefited the beavers, who rediscovered an abundant food source that hadn't been there for years, and just six years after the wolves returned, the once bare valley sides were regenerated with an abundance of cottonwood, willow and aspen. As the beavers expanded and built new dams and ponds, they provided habitats for birds, muskrats and aquatic life, and the now robust forests saw the return of songbirds that hadn't been seen there for years. And not only did the wolves keep the deer population down, they also killed coyote. As a result, the number of rabbits, mice and small rodents increased, which in turn encouraged more hawks, foxes and badgers. The bear population and other scavengers like ravens, eagles and magpies also increased as they feasted on the carcasses of the animals killed by the wolves, and fed on the regenerated vegetation. In addition to all these benefits, an extraordinary thing happened. The behaviour of the rivers changed, their banks were now stabilised by the newly regenerated forests, so they meandered less, formed more pools, and suffered less erosion. All this was great news for the wildlife and the overall health and appearance of the park. Today the park is thriving, as are the creatures who live there, and it's all thanks to the wolves. The advantages of their reintroduction continue to astonish biologists, and it's incredible to think that just one relatively small change can have just a massive impact on not only the ecosystem of the park, but its physical geography as well. The butterfly effect is all around us. In the Simpsons movie, if Homer hadn't hit himself with the hammer while fixing the roof, the town wouldn't have been trapped under the dome. The hammer hit led to the dare contest. The dare contest led to Bart skating to Krusty Burger naked, where Homer met the pig. The pig led to the silo. The silo led to the lake being poisoned, and the poisoned lake led to the dome. We are all living, breathing examples of the butterfly effect. Every little thing that your ancestors and everyone before you has done led up to you and everything you do today, tomorrow, next week, will change the course of not only your life, but an untold number of lives around you. So if you think for one second that you're not important and your life doesn't matter, you couldn't be further from the truth.